We have one of the best episodes of the year for you. We love the Splain Yourself episode where we really battle about our rankings with one another. And don't forget, you have a few hours left to get the Ultimate Draft Kit today. It launches in the morning. You can get pre-pricing right now. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your host, Andy Holloway. Jason Moore and Mike Wright. Uh, welcome in. Tuesday, May 31st. It's not going to be May no more. That means it's UDK time. Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers back with you. Big show today. Explain yourself. Ranking debates on the show. News to talk about. Jason mentioned it. The ultimate draft kit comes out tomorrow. A lot of you know what that is. If you don't, you should find out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nicely done the ultimate draft kit it releases tomorrow which means that the app will be available all the content in the udk which means 100 plus player profile videos all of our projections rankings but the headline is that this is a living breathing ever-changing resource for your draft season this is not just a release and then we you know sail off into the sunset See you later. Good luck. It's only just begun. Thank you, Jason. That was good. Okay. Yeah. I felt like you semi-committed to that. Yeah, I started yeah. okay, yeah. and then I realized I can't sing. Did you get a little shaky? Yeah. Kind of hit the eject button there. <laughs> so updates. Too much Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> updates will happen throughout the entire offseason. Very excited about some of the upgrades you know, you guys could share what your favorite thing is. I'm most excited about the cheat sheet creator upgrades this year because that's how I've always done my drafts. You paper people. I'm a paper person. You're an analog boy in a digital world. I live in the digital in the research, but when I show up on draft day, I like the paper in front of me. I like the smell of the Sharpie. Uh, you know, cross. Careful with that. <laughs> I know. I need my listen. The picks later in the draft are worse than the beginning. But I like, and, and so this year. We've always had the ability to print a cheat sheet out, but you've never really been able to customize it with what you want on draft day. If I want to have all the keepers hidden on the cheat sheet, if I want to highlight all of the players I've marked, if I want to see the sleepers breakouts and busts or the, you know, turn the bye weeks on and off or any of those features, we've built them into this year's UDK. It's brand new. I think you're going to love it. I cannot wait to get feedback from people tomorrow when it goes live. Yeah, my, my favorite new addition is the complete overhaul we've done to auctions. We used a Ph.D. student in mathematics, wizard uh, Matt DeSorbo behind the scenes, our CTO. We have really ground up, uh, rebuilt it to where not only is it amazing if you're in any kind of auction league, you could customize it to your budget, to your league size, to your uh, roster construction, and it will do the calculations. But I find that a really valuable insight now knowing how good the math is behind the scenes on that of just seeing like in my league settings, how valuable is this player versus another player, in, you know, in, in the same position or even across positions. But my favorite feature of the ultimate draft kit personally it's the injury report. I use it all the time. I my brain, yeah, I important. cannot like remember the dates and the sp the specific like okay, uh, I know they got injured here, but when was the surgery? What's the timeline on that? I don't have to remember nothing. Nothing. I just pull up the injury report. It's fantastic. And I'll jump in here. Uh if you have not checked out the uh, the player consistency portion of the UDK, uh one of the uh, you know, the pieces of our, our podcast, we are, it's fantasy football, but you know, essentially we are a news podcast. Like you, we got to get it out. You got to get the information. It can be tough to put out more evergreen content that you're like, I'm going to go back to that episode because like the waiver is week two. That's, that's no good to you. However, 
we do every every year after the season is done, we put out our truth series where we talk about how did these players actually perform? Were they consistent? Did they just finish? Did they hit a couple big spike weeks and end up in the top 12? And that's misleading of how that player actually helped your team throughout the season. And those numbers, like we have them beautifully displayed for you in the consistency area. So you can see like, you know, Travis Kelsey was a top 12 guy, 70% of his games. And then you might be surprised, oh, Gronk, 66% of his games, he was actually in the top 12. Like Gronk was crazy good when he was actually playing and not hurt. Meanwhile, you look at, you know, Darren Waller, who's supposed to be great, under half of his games as a top 12. Yeah, and, now, and we're going to talk about some of that consistency even in our rankings debates today. Um, but when you get in there, when you get into the Ultimate Draft Kit, share your feedback with us. Let us know what you like. We're always listening. We're always making upgrades based on feedback. And if you want to grab it right now before it releases, ultimatedraftkit.com. News and notes from around the league. David Njoku has signed a four-year extension with $28 million guaranteed. He's the fourth highest paid tight end now. For some reason. Well, it <laughs> uh, sort of. The numbers are a little misleading. This is a lot of uh, options and things. It's essentially like a two-year commitment to him, and then after that they can you know, kind of move move out. It's still a bit yes. surprising because yes, of the, the narrative around David Njoku for years. It was like this team didn't even like him. And so it does throw some cold water onto Harrison Bryant breakout yes, truthers. It, it does. In dynasty leagues. And it also gives some value to David Njoku just from a uh, breakout candidate standpoint. We, there are opportunities in this offense. You have a, a quarterback that can actually get it done in Deshaun Watson. You have Amari Cooper, who knows where he's at and what stage of his career. Donovan Peoples-Jones has been inconsistent. David Bell, who knows. So Njoku could provide some upside. He could. And this only adds fuel to that fire. Yeah, Austin Hooper had 61 targets in this offense last year with not as good a quarterback. So Njoku, if, if you haven't been in fantasy long enough, when he was coming out several years ago was a – superstar athlete first round pick like that he was supposed to be great and has definitely disappointed for his career but the fact that he's getting money Austin Hooper is gone quarterback upgrade there is a path towards a breakout it won't happen because it never happens for tight ends <laughs> please understand that but the path is there and yeah we, we've seen he had 639 yards four touchdowns in his second season finished at nine at the position last year 475 and four and we've seen you know, Watson throw touchdowns to the tight end position. You had that Darren Fells year back in 2019 where he had seven touchdowns. Like and that's, Darren, that's where my hope comes from. And Darren Fells is like at the time was he was not David and Joku. So yeah, there's, there's hope for a, for a guy who's in the prime of his career. It appears that Jerry Judy's legal situation may be coming to an end. Yep. Uh, the district attorney's office filed a motion to d dismiss charges. Yeah. So that is a good uh, piece of news. Yeah, that would most likely indicate no suspension coming. Now, remember, Chill. yeah, we it would like the 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 personal conduct policy of the NFL, which is kind of always evolving. Like they've had some changes here where Roger Goodell is not the the final say anymore of the the player conduct suspension. So. Still possible that something comes down, but the DA has said this is nothing and move along. Two pieces of injury news before we move into explain yourself. Explain yourself. Thank you. You're welcome. Jameis Winston moving with a visible limp at OTAs. Uh, he also had surgery on the meniscus. So talk to Matthew Betts, our injury guy. He's not surprised. Thinks he'll be okay for week one. I mean, I'd rather no limp. That's one of my right. policies, but... Not uh, unexpected. Right. The limp was expected given the surgery and the timeline right now. What I have heard... Was, he's just limping on the other leg, though. <laughs> no, yeah, I, not really. I have heard... Um, he is... I mean, you know, this is this is the season for this kind of... Ooh, tis the season. Tis the season for this kind of <laughs> stupid fluff pieces. But I heard it from an actual player, and not a, a beat reporter, that they are really impressed by Jameis Winston. He is their 
Ever, he's first one in every single day. He's there when everybody gets there, and he's working his tail off. So, that, I think, mean, that's good. You think he might he might eat some W's this year? <laughs> oh, <laughs> at least a few. Yeah. I watched that clip he again. He plays the Panthers. If you have, if you have not seen <laughs> Jameis Winston attempt to hype his team up by eating a W, it is one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. And his teammates just had to try to support him yeah. in it. It was great. One of the one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen, and and at least top ten for Jameis. <laughs> top yeah. ten. We could uh, get this guy like a some what, motivational. What was the collegiate shrimp situation? Uh, oh, the crab. The crab. It was yeah, crab. There was there was. Did a he theft. steal some? He some did. Crab? Yeah. <laughs> As a younger lad, seems he, like there's better things to steal. Yeah, he made a mistake. <laughs> you said, see, I thought where you were going with what we need to get Jameis Winston oh. is a camera crew that just follows. I mean, talk about great. I would reality watch, television. I would, I would watch a Jameis reality show. Let, Life give, as Jameis Winston. Yeah. Give oh, me man. the Winstons. All right, George Kittle. I didn't like this. Set oh. to miss OTA's lower body injury. You see, the reason I don't like it is we haven't played football yet. Right and. George Brittle oh. is somebody that you just – look, if you want the pat on the butt to put him in the upper echelon of tight ends, to draft him like that again, we just had a mock draft episode. If you didn't listen to it, it was last week. You can go run it back. But George Kittle was was sitting there as a maybe steal where he went in the draft, which I think was fourth round. That is correct. And maybe not. I mean, it, this is – don't watch the games. Just hold your breath and hope he makes it through. He just seems like he is on that trajectory to just be marked by injury for years and years. Yeah. And maybe I'm overstating it because obviously you're injury prone until you're not. But he, just the way he plays the game, right? We always used to say that about Thomas Rawls or about certain players. They just they play the game violently. No regard for his body. He play he plays That first down's more important than my body. Yes. So be be warned. I mean, that is a risk, and that's part of the UDK. We put a risk rating on players, and that factors into things like their auction value. I mean, if you have a higher risk rating, even if we have you ranked very high, that may impact what you should go for in an auction draft. Any other news, Brooksy? No, sir. That's false. You are now married. Oh, oh Brooksy! Woo! That's breaking news. And my favorite part was any pictures that were shared from that wedding were immediately followed by like 50 comments of which yacht were you on. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And just so you know, it was the pictures were spread across all the yachts. So it wasn't just one yacht that the pictures were taken on. We moved between multiple yachts during was, the wedding. It was the first time we were actually invited onto the yacht. Which yeah. was nice. Yeah. I mean, he still has his private yacht that only he and his wife go on. And the staff. And the staff. I took some silverware. Oh, Did nice. Did you? Oh, yeah. you're The little wealthy. tiny spoons? Yeah. Yeah. With the big B on there. I took some crab. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. I'm quite well, thank you. No. Clearly you are not. No rational person would do as you have done. Explain yourself. Explain yourself. As uh, a one-third owner of this company, I never want to see that introduction <laughs> video again. That was not approved. That was the worst video I've ever seen. I, I was fine with it, Jay. I How thought it was very good. Yeah, it was great. Some, some of our best friends. I am not joking. Oh. All right. Explain yourself. We both have, uh, or we all, all three of us have a couple of players that in our initial run through projections, walking through the teams, the rankings seem interesting. They seem out of the norm, out of the consensus. And so. For Look, one this, of us. For one of the of the three of us. And these are situations in which we demand uh, that you explain yourself. We'll kick it off here. Much talked about. Yeah. Gabe Davis. Mm, Gabriel. Wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. And, uh, well, look, I, I'm not surprised you would call him Gabriel mm -hmm. instead of Gabe. Because, the angel. Because you're the one projecting him to grow up. 
That's right. And you go by the more formal name as you grow. So, Jason, you have him ranked significantly higher than Mike or myself. I don't think it's an unreasonable ranking if you're make if you're stepping out and taking a leap on Gabriel Davis. You have him at 28. It's still outside the top 24 wide receivers. Mike and I have him in the 40s. But I mean, you have him taking a leap forward. 69 receptions, 925 yards, eight touchdowns. Right now, he's being drafted in this range. So, I mean, you could throw it on to Mike and I as why we don't like him. But make us the argument for Gabe Davis taking a step forward. I would love to. Um, Gabriel Davis is a player that when he's been on the field, he's passed the eyeball test to me. I've actually really liked the way he looks. I think he gets open. He's a big-bodied guy, you know, 6'2", 210 plus. I That's the type of wide receiver I like. The offense is great, but I want to talk about what he's done because a lot of hype. If if you are a football fan and you are, you're listening to this, you remember the Gabriel Davis playoff game. Yes. The AFC Championship game that was one of the best games of all time. Not, I mean, both for Gabe, Gabriel Davis, but also just for football. It was amazing. But in that game, he had 201 yards, four touchdowns, and a lot of fantasy hype came because of that game. But I want to get rid of that game. I want to look at, okay... That was an out. That was an outlier. That's the best game he'll ever have in his career, even if he becomes a Hall of Famer. Like two hundred and four. Right. That's an all timer. He was only in his second year. Right. He was a sophomore player last year, and the team went out and they signed Emmanuel Sanders. And Emmanuel Sanders started the year looking like a great signing. If you remember in fantasy football. Oh yeah, I traded for him right before he stopped doing it. Absolutely. <laughs> he, he. You know, he's an he was an elder statesman. And he had some juice left, but the gas tank ran out about halfway through that season. In fact, it was week 10 when you saw basically the, the Bills say, okay, Emmanuel Sanders, you've been up in the 80, 90% of your snaps. Maybe why don't you take a, take a step back? And all of a sudden, that coincided with Gabriel Davis being the next man up. And he had five games where he had more than 50% of the snaps. This is just regular season throwing out the outrageously great playoffs in those five games that we already saw in his second year as a player he averaged seven targets 3.8 receptions 62.4 yards and over half a touchdown a game so his pace was 119 targets 64 receptions a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns the touchdowns what all, what, what games are being extrapolated there those are all the games where he played more than 50% of the snaps, which is the majority of games from week 10 on. Those games um, are where he averaged just really nice full season numbers. But the, the specialty of Gabe Davis is touchdowns. He has the second most touchdowns from the 20 class behind only Justin Jefferson, despite the fact that he has not been a full-time player. And this might blow your mind, but Josh Allen – has had more end zone pass attempts than any other quarterback. That won't blow your mind. And that that means when the wide receiver is standing in the end zone and you've been targeted. Over the last two years, Gabriel Davis, who has not been a full-time player, and this does not include the crazy playoff run, has 23 red zone end zone targets. That is more than Devontae App. Adams or Cooper Cup. It's the same number as Justin Jefferson as a part-time player. This is a guy that the great offense, great quarterback Josh Allen looks for because he's a big body player in the end zone. If you want to talk breakout, he's going into his third year. The opportunity is there. They didn't really replace him, but they lost Cole Be Beasley and replaced him with Jamison Crowder. Crowder. And they lost Emmanuel Sanders and replaced him with Gabriel Davis going into his third year. So I think the targets go way up. He is a value around the end zone. The offense is great going into his third year. I think he has the chance to be a true breakout player, and he is the wide receiver, too, for this team. Like, in, in those games where he played more than 50% and he was averaging seven targets a game, uh, you know, uh, Dawson Knox was four targets a game, 4.1 targets in, in, in those games. So I think the opportunity, I like the talent. I think going into year three, I love the offense. I say you two need to explain yourself. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem with what you did with Gabriel Davis in the in the upside. I, you know, Dawson Knox missed a few games last year. He obviously scored a lot of touchdowns. Um, Stephon Diggs is still going to be a go-to target in that zone. But Gabriel Davis has an opportunity the same way that 
you know, probably more so than even a Josh Palmer because you have two wide oh, receivers yes. in Los Angeles. There's a lot of potential upside. I do think it's going to be spiky. I mean, I think that's going to be the na- – you, you said it. It's touchdowns, right? Yeah, it's, that's fair. Yeah, touchdowns, is it's a spiky thing. So, um, But I don't, I don't really have any – you know, you explained yourself, and I accept your explanation. I look forward to your guys' new rankings. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll take a look. I, when you were giving your full projections there, I'm actually not that far off from where you are. And that's uh, a hard part of just a a list of guys. Of this is my these are my wide receivers one through fifty because like I have Gabe Davis at wide receiver forty four currently, and the what separates my wide receiver 44 from Jason's wide receiver 28 is really not a a ton of points. So when you're looking at guys in this range, you do uh, you have what is the story, what is the narrative of you can see this player truly breaking out and I don't disagree that Gabriel Davis is one of those players that could have a massive breakout this year. Yeah, last year just for context, I know we saw the AFC title game, 35 receptions over the course of this se- season for Gabriel Davis, 102 fewer targets than Stephon Diggs. Needs to take that step forward. Needs to not have, like, you know, Khalil Shakir make a role for himself and things of that nature. But yeah, I he, see it. I mean, ha- you want to be connected with a great quarterback. Yeah, he has to take a step forward. This isn't just like, oh, progress a little bit. This has to be you play way more snaps and are a different, more involved player. All right, let's take a quick break, and then you guys can grill me. The next player we want to talk about is the great Michael Thomas <laughs> of the New Orleans Saints. Look, I'm, we're, we'll get it there. We'll get it there. Uh, Michael Thomas, who went on the field, a dominant wide receiver one, has uh, taken some time off recently, has had a quarterback change also. Jason and I still giving the season veterans some respect to have him inside of our top 20, while Andy has him outside of his top 25. Andy, explain yourself. Well, I mean, you said the great Michael Thomas. Yes. That's kind of like... I managed to say that. That's like the faces <laughs> on Mount Rushmore. Look, I don't mind you giving credit to things once done long ago. <laughs> Mike, I want to I want to share something with you. December 22nd, 2019. That was the last time Michael Thomas finished inside the top 15 on a week. Was that a long time ago? That was the last <laughs> time he scored a touchdown. It was 891 days ago. Mm. So mm. not 1,000, which, I mean, if you want to count that into – look, you guys should both be more afraid at 17 than I am at 30. I'm terrified. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> here's the problem. Michael Thomas, I don't think – look, he's not peaking, right? Like physically, he's not getting better right now as an athlete. He's almost 30 years old. He's almost 900 days removed from a night uh, from a touchdown. He wasn't impressive on the field when we saw him briefly in 2020. Um uh, he's fine. I I think he's still mostly Michael Thomas. But Michael Thomas is 11.7 a catch. Michael Thomas is Tyler Boyd in his per catch metrics. Michael Thomas is volume so if you tell me that the last time we saw him on the field, he was competing with Traquan Smith and he had Drew Brees as his quarterback and he's 11 a catch, and you're telling me you need 10 touchdowns for Michael Thomas for him to hit that 17 mark, and then you tell me he's never done it in his career, he's never had a double-digit touchdown season, ever, even with Drew Brees. So when I look at this situation, there's just no way Michael Thomas approaches historical success. Injury concerns, age, and then competition. Jason, you and I were talking in the office yesterday. The wide receiver room in New Orleans, it's one of the deepest in football now. It's very interesting. You have Michael Thomas, yes, but you have Chris Olave, who, yeah, I mean, throw away the Marvin Harrison comparisons that came out of OTAs already. But this is a high draft capital investment. This is maybe their best actual wide receiver on the roster. And then you have... Jarvis Landry, what does he do? 11 a catch. He's Michael Thomas. Like, that's what he does in the offense. Separation, escape valve for Jameis Winston. He's going to be valuable. You still have Traquan Smith. You have Deontay Hardy. You have Marquez Callaway. This is a very deep wide receiver room. You're bringing up a lot of trash names there at the end. Hey. But 
You can't. You respect the name of Hardy, my friend. That guy's sneaky. Good. I will accept the trash name being associated with Traquan Smith. I will accept that. Yeah, the, the jury. Calloway. The jury agrees. Okay, but 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 I mean, do you guys want to talk about James Winston being valuable last year in the time that he was on the field? That was with Marquez Callaway. That was with Deontay Harris, who's now Deontay Hardy. So I, I just think, look, is there upside for Michael Thomas? It's it. No. I don't think yeah. there is. I actually don't think that there's upside for him and and zero chemistry with Jameis Winston. We do not we've never seen it on the field before. Um fifteen completions a game. You talk about volume. Winston was fifteen completions a game, not forty five pass attempts, Drew Brees. That's because he was throwing touchdowns left, right, and center. <laughs> well, to Marquez Galloway, I mean, down the field. So I, I, I would agree with the the upside argument. But, you know, a lot of what you were saying, like he hasn't done the double-digit touchdowns, he'll never get back to where he is. I completely agree. Mike, I, I'm sure Mike does as yeah, well. Yeah, I do. But where he was before was the wide receiver one. We've got him at wide receiver 17 as, as a wide receiver two. This comes down completely to me about health. If Michael Thomas is actually healthy, and that is a big if, you, you'll see in the ultimate draft kit his risk rating is he's not an unrisky draft pick, uh, especially, goodness gracious, two years removed from an ankle injury and you're still not practicing in full. So I, I am fine if you just say, I am O-U-T on Michael Thomas. You can deal with the ankle injury. But my rankings, and, and, and as of right this second, my belief is that if Michael Thomas gets back on the field, which the projection he should, if he is out there, he's going to still dominate the target share. I realize that you've got two other capable wide receivers, but you know this is a, a, a player who is really, really good, and if he has 130 targets, which is very reasonable in this offense, he's going to be a wide receiver too. Um, but again, the, the ankle... The ankle is, yeah, it's super sketch, super sketch. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is, as of this moment in best ball, Gabriel Davis is going ahead of Michael Thomas. Oh. So there, there is there is a consensus fear, like I am in the consensus fear wise. I mean, I have him at thirty. His best ball ADP is wide receiver thirty. So if I can get you know, if you guys can get him there, and you think he can be even seventeen. That's a value. I certainly don't mind that. Um, but any time that I look at that situation and I go, Michael Thomas could be the number one fantasy wide receiver for the Saints, or he could be like, I don't know, he could be like the fourth target in terms of total volume. Like Alvin Kamara is going to get the ball passed to him a bunch. Olave is looking great in OTAs and was drafted to really be involved in this offense. I just don't have the confidence, but I think it's been laid out pretty clearly. Mike, we have to turn to you because yes. <clears throat> this is probably this is probably our biggest actual philosophical disagreement rankings wise across all positions so far this offseason, in my opinion. Now what I didn't realize was that Jason was mostly with me on this. Uh Cortland Sutton, you have him at eleven. I am at twenty two, Jason at nineteen. We have talked about him in the past, but this is an offense with a lot of weapons. This is an offense with a uh, not just Tim Patrick, not just Jerry Judy, who seems like the legal problems are behind him, a couple of running backs that are valuable, K.J. Hamler ahead of schedule, Albert Guaybanam. There is a lot of unknown in this offense in terms of target distribution. Russell Wilson will provide high-value targets, but you have him at 11, which to me feels like a really big leap. So, Jason, if you don't mind, please ask Mike. Mike. Would you explain yourself? All right. So the conversation of Cortland Sutton, it's it's two different conversations You because you can start with the player and the quarterback. I'll start with Russell Wilson, who Russell Wilson since 2015 has supported at least one top 15 wide receiver throughout that time. Russell Wilson in that uh, – Seattle offense, the run first Seattle offense, where they Russ bail us out because the run run didn't work. This is basically since 2012, they've been a top ten offense in points per game. Like Russell Wilson is not just good; Russell Wilson is great, and he has been great for fantasy purposes as well. Uh, and then you look at what Cortland Sutton has had to deal with over the course of his career. We're talking about Case Keenum. Joe Flacco, Drew Locke, and Teddy Bridgewater. And Joe Flacco. There's a Mount Rushmore yeah, you don't want to visit. Look, 
again, Joe Flacco, who like he stands out as the best quarterback on that list. Joe Flacco, for minor Super Bowl winning quarterback, I say that with a wink, but in 2019, that's when Sutton was having the breakout year. When Joe Flacco was the quarterback, he was averaging five and 80 per game. Like those are really, really strong numbers. Okay, and so let's look back at what Cortland Sutton did last year. On 98 targets, Cortland Sutton had two receiving touchdowns. The Broncos wide receivers last year combined that for... That sounds like a bad year. Yeah, but, but was it just Sutton or the Broncos wide receivers combining for eight total receiving touchdowns? We're talking between Patrick, Judy, and Cortland Sutton. Like, nothingness was happening, and it because it was Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke in those couple games. Players in the 90-target range, like where Cortland Sutton was, Adam Thielen, 10 touchdowns. Tyler Boyd, 5 touchdowns. Even the lowly, uh, which... I don't mean to call him that, but Russell Gage, who last year was no, considered, that's fine. That's considered fine. the lowly, even he had four touchdowns, double the amount that Cortland Sutton had because they were at, they were actually getting targets from a good quarterback. So Russell Wilson coming in and with what I am projecting, Cortland Sutton to be the number one wide receiver on this team, and I'm doing that because he's the one who has actually done it. Now, Tim Patrick is solid, but Tim Patrick – does not have ceiling like Cortland Sutton does. Cortland Sutton was paid. He is 26 years old. He just got that new gigantic contract. He had the second highest average depth of target among wide receivers. Russell Wilson certainly loves that and knows how to get that done with guys like Tyler Lockett. So it's it's not just Cortland Sutton is is bigger and can catch touchdowns. No, it's he can actually hit big plays down the field as well. I think he is uh, just an immense talent who has not been able to be unlocked because of the situation around him with those sub-average quarterbacks that he has had to play with. So Russ coming in, and what if, it, like in the range of outcomes, Russ doing all of those things, like averaging 30-plus touchdowns every year, what happens if he gets more volume? Sure, maybe he throws some more interceptions, but... You're gonna have a higher. You're gonna have a higher yardage output. You're gonna have a higher touchdown output. Andy, you've brought up the AFC West uh, at least a few times. Of what happens in those games when he's playing against Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert? Russ is gonna have to get it done. And I'm projecting that Cortland Sutton is the clear number one wide receiver, even though he is not being drafted uh, anywhere near where I have him ranked. I think he is an absolute steal ADP wise. It, it's funny because Andy brought up he was surprised that I was more on Andy's side, and, and I am ranking-wise. The reason that he was surprised, though, is because I'm, I'm in on Cortland Sutton. I, I think Cortland Sutton will no, be the one. No, you are not. <laughs> I, I think Cortland Sutton will be the one for the Broncos. I think that, I mean, you, you brought it up. Russell Wilson has always had a top 15 wide receiver that he's supported. It's just really tough for me to get there. Like, you have Cortland Sutton with 150 targets. I can't get there. I mean, DK Metcalf the last two years has had 129 targets, and that was with pretty much only Tyler Lockett. Now you've got uh, you've got KJ Hamler along with Tim Patrick and Jerry Judy, uh, a couple good tight ends. So I, I think that he could get to your ranking, but I don't think it'll come the way that you have him. It'll it'll probably be double double digit touchdowns if it happens uh, versus 150 targets. Well, I think that I think the conviction is. I think the difference is the, the conviction on definitively the number one option in the offense. You know, last year, Tim Patrick, Carlin Sutton, very similar reception totals, very similar yardage. Jerry Judy still with upside to potential to break out. So sure. uh, I think that's all it is. I think, I think we all agree Russ is going to elevate every piece of this offense consistently. And it's just a matter of, are you going to be? Are you going to draft them where you have them, and then be disappointed because it's a Judy week or a Patrick week or somebody else? Or is it going to be a very? Is it going to be what we saw in the very beginning of the year last year, where look, it looked like in week two, Corlin Sutton was the steal of the draft. Yes, where he went out, and I bet you people acquired him after that week, and then it didn't go the way that they hoped. But I, I think we all agree that the lift will happen by Russell Wilson. Now, much more egregiously. Oh. I this this one is oh look, yeah I, I'm I don't want here we go I don't want to be rude but you're dumb bring it on Deontay Johnson Sorry. Mike and I have ranked at 19 and 22 which in and of itself could be disrespectful to Deontay Johnson but you are an embarrassment sir you have him at 41 mm -hmm. 
correctly. Um, 41? Not correctly. Last year, he had 169 targets and 107 receptions. You have dug a, dug a grave and thrown him in. And, and to have him at 41 after the season's that he has had after the clear evidence of his elite separation. And for you to believe in a guy like Michael Thomas to go out there and be, you know, good despite the lack of Drew Brees and then take Deontay Johnson and spit upon this man, ranking him outside the top 36 wide receivers. He was a top 10 wide receiver last year. Jason, explain yourself. Happily. Happily. Um, yeah, I, I am obviously down on Deontay Johnson. I'm out. Andy, you have brought this up many times before that a bad quarterback can wreck a great wide receiver. Your go-to example is the great first ballot Hall of Famer Larry Fitzgerald, the 6'3", 218-pound wide receiver who, when he had bad quarterbacks, was the wide receiver 37 and 52. So now let's look at the 5'10", 182-pound, also good wide receiver, Deontay Johnson, and say, what if his quarterback play is bad? Maybe he's not going to be great. And so here's my argument Wasn't for Deontay Johnson. Wasn't it bad last year? Well, let's let's compare that. Let's see if it was really, really bad and, and, and egregious, because I agree, Big Ben, this was the worst Big Ben we've ever seen. Granted, Hall of Fame quarterback Big Ben, who hyper-targets his wide receiver one, but he was the worst version of himself. I believe, rightly or wrongly, and we'll know more closer to the season, I believe that Kenny Pickett starts the season. Uh, that's how I've projected the Steelers. And so at the very least, for this argument, let's indulge that idea to see what it might look like should Kenny Pickett start the season. In this situation, Kenny Pickett will not throw for more than Big Ben's 3,740 3, yards. Mac Jones last year, who was fantastic, threw for 3,500. Trevor Lawrence under that. Uh, the comps to Kenny Pickett of, of Dalton and Carr, they were in the 3,300s. Kenny Pickett will not throw for more touchdowns than Big Ben's 22. Over the last decade, there have been seven first-round quarterbacks that started their entire rookie se season, and they have averaged 17 touchdowns. Last year, Trevor Lawrence had 10 passing touchdowns the 17 Woof. game pace for Zach Wilson was 11.8 for Justin Fields was 11.9 all of these quarterbacks were much more uh, highly touted uh, higher drafted than Kenny Pickett I have Deontay Johnson going from a 25.5 percent target share to a 24 percent that's still a good number it's just not as great but it's part of a smaller pie and I have Deontay Johnson going from a, a pretty outrageous 36% of the touchdowns at his size. And that, that, I mean, that's just a really, really high number. You know, that's that's higher than Devontae Adams was to a reasonable 22% of the touchdowns. But again, of a smaller pie. And this is just how the stats play out. What I am uh, bringing to light here is that a bad year is in the range of outcomes for Deontay Johnson. And you need to be aware of that possibility because he's seen as this super safe PPR option. He very well could PPR his way to 100 receptions like he did last year if he is hyper-targeted by Kenny Pickett. But again, Kenny Pickett is mobile. Kenny Pickett will, one, he takes some time to process and <laughs> he is able to scramble and get out of the pocket. He's going to do that in his rookie year, you see that a lot of times from rookies. Big Ben was a statue in the pocket for a bad offensive line who took the ball from the center and threw it to Deontay Johnson immediately. I don't think that happens this year, and I think the touchdowns won't be there. So my yeah, stats I mean, we're, haven't fallen to We're not really debating. 41. We're not debating anything from the same grounds. Like, we're, we're starting from different points. So well, like, I mean, if, is if Mitchell I was, Trubisky really? Yeah, yeah he is going to win the job. No, 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 no. That's fine. I'm saying is he really – that much better than a I mean he's Kenny Pickett. He supported high volume Allen Robinson in his career. He has, and so, uh, but if we if we begin with the like the same starting point, which I won't begin with, but if we did, but you know, it's a compelling argument. If Kenny Pickett's the starter, I'm not taking Deontay Johnson at nine overall because a rookie's not supporting that. So you're absolutely right. I'm not willing to make that leap, Mike. I don't know if you are that Kenny Pickett's going to be the starter. I know that. In OTAs, it's been first rep, Mitch Trubisky. I know that Mason Rudolph's involved in the rotation. So As of right now, I do have Kenny Pickett winning the job. 
Um, and it's it's the the argument for Kenny Pickett is difficult because the look, the numbers are very staggering in uh, that the fact that rookie quarterbacks just they don't perform that well for as in like they don't support fantasy wide receivers. Seventy percent of rookie quarterbacks since two thousand four have not sustained a top thirty six. Right. The the thing about that though is like Trevor Lawrence was the number one overall pick, meaning he went to a crap team. All like uh Zach Wilson was number what three overall? He went to a crap team. Or number two overall, thank you. He went to a really bad team. This is just this is such a different situation here where the Pittsburgh Steelers franchise has been so well managed and run under Mike Tomlin that even when uh, you know Big Ben was out for the year and we had to deal with watching uh, Mason Rudolph and Doc Hodges, which that was Deontay Johnson's rookie year, Deontay still showed the promise of like, we, we knew that watching Deontay Johnson with Mason Rudolph – well, this guy's good. He when, when Big Ben comes back, we're going to see some real stuff here, and so it the situation and Deontay Johnson, Claypool, a high pick in uh, in Pickens, like the Muth. This team is loaded. This team is not the New York Jets of last year. This team is not the Jacksonville Jaguars of last year, where they're just trying to trying to find some wide receiver pieces. So, and again, like I, I can't give a full statistical argument. It just is to me looking at it that this is just such a different situation and Deontay Johnson is such a different type of wide receiver who gets open and a, a court a rookie quarterback is going to love a wide receiver who I see him open this isn't Chase Claypool who I have to trust he's coming down with the 50-50 ball this is I can clearly see that Deontay Johnson is wide open so I'm more at 22 uh versus what is where I have him it's it is. It's actually under where he's being drafted in best ball and underdog right now. I do understand where you're coming from, that there could be a, a bad, bad year for Deontay Johnson. But I think even a bad, bad year, he's still in the top 36. He's also not showing up at OTAs. He's in a contract dispute of sorts. Um, they got to get that picket to Pickens uh, in yeah, OTA. Get, yeah. it, get it going. It's just fun to say. Yeah. All right, Andy. <laughs> okay, you're up now, mister. We're talking about David Montgomery, uh, a, a very solid running back. I think that's the highest praise I can give him, who is <laughs> playing on a very poor uh, Chicago Bears franchise. I think that's the highest praise I can give them. Um, you have, as a top 10 running back, coming in as your running back eight, I have him, and, and Mike and I both have him, as a solid RB2, but down at 17 and 22, I have some follow-up questions, but you can start. So, Andy, <laughs> explain yourself. You guys actually both have him about where his best ball ADP is. Uh, look, no one, no one enjoys drafting David Montgomery for some reason. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. I have him ranked at eight. It's very high. He finished at four in 2020. Was were the Bears good then? They were okay. Okay. The, last year he was on eleven hundred and nine pace. His points per game at the running back position was the running back nine. So I haven't ranked where he was on a horrible, devastatingly bad offense. Two straight years, seventy five percent of running back snaps. You you read about what's happening in camp. This is David Montgomery's backfield. There are no indications that Khalil Herbert is stealing snaps from him, nor were there when Montgomery returned from injury. They brought in uh, Kari Blazingame, uh, a real true fullback. Um, to me, the, the variable is Justin Fields. Like if Justin Fields, like the splits with Justin Fields on the field mm. versus David Montgomery with another quarterback, they were not as beneficial to Montgomery because of the running prowess of Justin Fields, and then the offense just plain not moving. So that's the variable to me, but my ranking is based on volume. There are very few running backs that get his level of production. He had 54 receptions in 13 games played last year. That's 60-plus reception numbers from a durable, difference-making running back that finished at four, that would have finished at nine by points per game last year if he hadn't missed game due to injury. I'm just ranking him where he's been. I mean, he has been a consistent 
contributor in fantasy for two consecutive years. Um, he wins people leagues regularly. And I think he's a high volume RB two that you can get very late. I mean, he's one of the best bargains in fantasy. That's my, that's my case. Yeah. I, I, the, the hardest part for me with David Montgomery is my projections don't hate him. Like my numbers, when, when you see the raw numbers, they, they're, they don't look like someone who's going to finish the running back 22. It's a matter of liking players more than him. The question comes down to those, the, the, the receptions, like when, Justin Fields is the full-time guy. Will he be seeing those games of six-plus targets regularly? And we know that – He saw fewer last year with Justin Fields than right. without him. So I, I give you that. Yeah, that is it, the variable. Because we we just, we know – it like Lamar Jackson, like guys that really can run. And Justin Fields towards the you – know, the after the, 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 the terrible first half that he had of his rookie career, he started running a lot more. Uh, maybe that was just him, you know, freaking out or say him saying that n no one else on this team is getting it done for me, so I'm going to get it done. But that turns into fewer checkdowns for the running back position. So I, that's my biggest fear for Montgomery simply is reception related. Yeah. So I, I have a, a different thought, which uh, it, it goes back to Andy. You were saying you, you keep saying he was the running back nine by points per game, but. I I can't find that to be true. Yeah, he's thirteen point four, thirteen point four in the games that he played last year. Yeah, but per game, which fit, which is right behind, right ahead of Cordero Patterson, or right behind Cordero Patterson in, in the rankings last on, year in points per game and half point. No, on on points per game last year, he he should be the running back twenty one, um, is where he's showing up in our oh thirteen point five would be. Just behind Aaron Jones, 13.5, DeAndre Swift, Elijah Mitchell, Dalvin Cook, Nick Chubb, Najee, Christian McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette, James Conner, Kamara, Mixon, Eckler, Taylor. Are you really Henry. reading 20 names? <laughs> well, I just want – I mean – I mean, that we have a difference of, of what maybe we looked at. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there was – I mean, I'm looking at points per game for all running backs versus – um, saying, okay, his points per game, how does that qualify to like the, the total season of everybody? Um, but in points per game, if you take all running backs points per game, he was 21. And I view the Bears as worse this coming year yeah. um, than they were last year. So I the leap to being top 10 is really the, the difficulty with the receptions. I actually like David. You, you said at the beginning, like when you draft David Montgomery, nobody's excited. I feel like I feel like I really like to have Montgomery, but only as a running back too. As you know, if I've got a high end running back one, I think he's a good plug and play guy. Uh, I think the issue here is just what is his ceiling, and I just don't see that huge ceiling on this terrible t bottom five team uh, with with Fields who might not pass the ball uh, and utilize his skill set as much. That's that's my issue is more the top end play. Explained. All right, Mike. Cam Akers. You have a right. 19. We have them too low. Yeah. Explain yourself. Uh, this one is – it's a really – it's it's easy for me because watching Cam Akers in his playoff run was painful. Uh, we give full credit to the man tearing his Achilles in the preseason and actually getting back onto the field in, this, in the same exact season was – a miracle of modern medicine. It's something that I don't recall truly seeing. And not just getting back on the field, but getting back on the field and becoming the guy. And the the argument for Cam Akers to me just comes down to this. The Rams are good. They're coming off of a Super Bowl championship. They're going to be in the running again for uh, making it to the playoffs, winning the NFC West, especially comparing themselves to the other teams in the NFC West. And Sean McVay... If he like he's a one running back guy, like it's it's buried in a in a lot of noise. But going back to Todd Gurley, Todd Gurley, I mean, they absolutely just ran him into the floor, and that degenerative knee that he had, it really became a problem. And then you go to this season, Daryl Henderson, at the beginning of the season, he looked like a, a one of the top steals of the running back position because you weren't really sure. Is he going to be the guy? And because you had the Acres injury, when do you go in on Henderson? 
And Henderson was very, very good for fantasy purposes from weeks one through 12. Well, then you have, you know, the Henderson getting injured as he does. And then when Sony Michelle went off, it was everything for him. He'd seen nearly 90% of the snaps for Sony Michelle. And then as soon as Cam Akers was ready, he was basically the full time running back again. You get some more, some more real rehab time for him over the off season. And like, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about Cam Akers, the player, if he keeps looking like the player who he was in the playoffs, who I can't, what was the number? He was like sub three, a carrier. He was sub four for sure. And it just was really, really inefficient, but getting a ton of work. And it doesn't, but that doesn't matter. My opinion on Cam Akers does not matter. What matters is, does Sean McVay like him? Because if Sean McVay likes him, he's going to put him out there. And if he's out there, he's going to get a ton of work and the Rams are going to score a ton of touchdowns. So it, it really just, it, it's as easy as that. For all of us, though, we're all under where he is going as the running back 16 in the late fourth, uh, currently in best ball. So clearly we all have our concerns about what he can be. But if Akers is actually healthy and ready to go, he will he'll be a top 10 running back. I top 10 if he is actually ready to go. And that's a really big question. That's a really big statement. Yeah, I mean top 10 is top 10 is a a tough one for me. I think the range of outcomes on Akers, uh, he's he's in the there's probably only four or five players like him where the upside is tremendous, the downside is tremendous. Yeah. Like the the unknowns. I mean, Elijah Mitchell fits that bill too. Where sure, you know, if, if he's the guy and he's healthy and he's on the field, he's probably going to be a top ten player. Cam Akers, look, I, I want that to happen. I think I have him ranked too low. I think he's more of a value than where I currently have him. I'm just afraid of what I saw, and when I looked at this team and was projecting it, it didn't get me there. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it's 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 funny to me for you to be the the high man up because when I hear or see a new it's devastating, it's like, oh no, a running back tore his Achilles. My brain goes to he's dead to Mike. That's like yes. how I yes. I view the Achilles injury like in marriage with your hatred for running back Achilles injuries. So it's funny that you've given the grace, and maybe it's because he got back healthy last season, you've given him the grace like that you give nobody for running back Achilles injuries. I looked up the playoffs uh, just because you were curious. You said you knew it was sub four. It was, <laughs> was 2.5. So oh, man. Uh, he, he had 67 carries for 172 yards. And yet he was given at least 13 carries in every single one of those playoff games. Yeah, I mean, McVay kept giving him the ball. So he's going to get the opportunity. That's what my entire argument for Cam Akers is. is I got a spoiler for you. Uh, like a car spoiler? No, that was dumb. Oh man, that was that really was, dumb. Can that, you hit a button? Uh, that was awful. Uh, all right, not good. Um, I know you had a rough morning, but please don't do that again. Uh, here's the spoiler: if he if he looks like that, um, he's not gonna do that all year long. Like Sean McVay is not giving him the ball. Like you you don't get just because we saw it in the playoffs. Like you had limited options. You got a couple games. If he runs for two point whatever to carry in the regular season, you will not see Cam Akers on the field beyond a few weeks. Because yeah, you, you just don't do that. You could also see. I mean, the the Rams have been known to trade for players mid season. You know, if 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 Cam Sony is, Michelle exactly. If if Cam is right, but they trade for Sony right after the and like speaking of Sony Michelle, they did not bring him back. So yeah, the we could get to the depth chart for the Rams in August, and I don't have the the exact same sentiment that I have right now, but. The current Rams depth chart is Cam Akers, Daryl Henderson, who, I mean, they, they put him out there because he was like the last man standing and he still produced. But then it's our, you know, the, the draft Twitter favorite, Kyron Williams, who they took, I believe, in the fifth round. The, this depth chart, the, the team has spoken with their actions saying, we still think that Cam Akers is going to be the dude. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Mike, uh, Andy, and I have him exactly the same spot. Thirty-two. Andy said he thinks he has him too low. I, I think I, I probably do too. There's thirty-two teams, and he's the clear starter of a great offense. Exactly. Um, he's suffering man, from some risk, but it could change. And like his best ball ADP of running back sixteen is, I, I, I don't, I just don't want that. I don't want that risk. There are certain players I think in the UDK and in our projections that are. Until further notice, players, mm -hmm. and they're they're very dependent on what training camp looks like, and there's a number of guys like that. 
and I imagine even you know, even the situation with Deontay Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, dependent on what camp looks like, who's the quarterback, that's going to impact my ranking of Deontay in the inverse if Pickett's the starter, and and maybe it will definitely impact mine if if Trubisky's the starter. So I, I think. Cam Akers is 100% in that category. That, that, that goes for J.K. Dobbins, too. I mean, J.K. Dobbins, what is the rotation like in Baltimore compared to Gus Edwards and other pieces? There are – Elijah Mitchell. I mean, there are a number of running backs that are until further notice running backs. If you're drafting now, you're taking a bigger chance than, than when you have more knowledge because when you have more information in training camp, you can make a better decision, and we don't have it. Yeah, it was where – I mean, J.K. Dobbins is an interesting name to throw out there because you compare that to Cam Akers – and it's like they are both the starter for uh, good offenses, and they're both coming off of injury, except J.K. Dobbins coming off a really clean ACL with a great timeline. I have Dobbins higher than Akers right now. I, I, I do as well. I guess I was just wondering. Well, yeah, draft. Mr. 32. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, <laughs> like, who's being drafted higher. Um, Part of that's just injury. It's like we see running backs come back from ACLs. They They don't have the same struggles. I mean, do any of us know whether, you know, like, is Marlon Mack the number one in Houston? Maybe. Right. I mean, it's he might possible. be. I mean, you could you could go into camp and Marlon Mack could look fine. We're also terrified of his Achilles and he could be dumb. You know, Deontay Foreman, he's the only one that we've seen kind of come back to higher volume and succeed. And that was years and years after. Yes. Which Mar is Marlon Mack scary. at least got on the field. Yeah, uh, like Cam Akers could have all the devotion to rehab in the world and it might not matter. Agreed. And that's yes. the that's the hard part. But I look, I don't have any I don't have any problem really with where you ranked him at all. I think you're almost we're all low. Yeah. We're all low on Cam Akers. Yeah, Domins is twenty, so he's four running back spots behind Akers. I would rather take that value personally. I would too. Okay, that is gonna do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Thank you for supporting the show. A uh, couple of quick reminders. Uh footclangiveaway.com. We're giving away a couple autographed jerseys. You can check that out. That's free to enter. And then one final reminder, if you're listening to this show um, on Tuesday. You're lucky. You you get a chance to pre-order the Ultimate Draft Kit at a discount. Uh, it releases tomorrow. We think you're going to really love the upgrades that we've put in there, uh, along with all of the content you've come to know and love from the Ultimate Draft Kit over the last seven years. So check that out at ultimatedraftkit.com. That'll do it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy your day. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.